Hi, I'm Zach. Today is a real treat for me because my next guest is an old friend from my hometown. Matt Rader is a poet and fiction writer from Comox, BC. He abandoned me to go live and work in Kelowna quite a few years ago now, so it's nice that he came to visit me today. Matt is a first year through graduate level professor at University of British Columbia, or UBC as we call it here. And what I love most about him is his intellectual playfulness. He's a deep creative thinker and I relish making conversation with Matt. Today we talk about parenthood, men's health, mindfulness. Of course, we also discuss poetry because Matt has a new book titled Ghost Talk. Ghost Talk is a deeply personal work and I was able to receive an advanced copy. So we'll share some of that work in the second half of the episode and discuss some of the other poems as well. This is Matt's fifth volume of poetry and it reads differently to me from his previous work. It's more accessible, it's beautifully crafted, and full of magic to be discovered, which we'll talk about. I don't want to give anything away. I devoured this book, but want to share my interest with you without revealing too much. So I hope this episode strikes a nice balance. Ghost Talk is available on October 31st, 2021 in Canada and early 2022 internationally. And I'll put more info in the show notes so you can pick up a copy as soon as it's out. Before we get started, I would like to dedicate this podcast to a special man who deeply influenced my love of reading and writing poetry. My favorite high school English teacher, Idris Hughes. Mr. Hughes adored reading, writing, and reciting poetry so much that his energy still bubbles up in me when I read or write a pleasing verse. Or see Meryl Streep, whom was the muse of many of his funny and beautiful poems. Passion for language and writing was a wonderful gift to receive from him, and I'd like to acknowledge him. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Matt Rader and I grew up in the same town, as I've mentioned, and I've followed his journey for a very long time. So hopefully that's a good thing. (laughs) Let's keep our fire hot with poet Matt Rader, Ghost Talk. I'm Zach White, and this is The Ranger Cabin. Everybody wants to be uh, a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, uh, somebody who is making mad bank, looking at doing space travel to Mars or curing cancer. And you have chosen a path that every parent in history has said, don't go down that road. (laughs) You're a poet. Yeah. What's that? What is like, how did you do that? And what is being a poet to you? Well, I don't know that I chose the path. I think the cliche is the path chose me. And there's a version of this story that I like starts in childhood. I was thinking about it actually, because I kind of suspected you would ask me this question, because even to myself, it's baffling. 43 years old, and I made my entire adult life out of poetry. And I own a house and a car and things I know somehow I survived. it's amazing yeah yeah it's yeah. totally crazy it's actually a dream of mine <laughs> to have done that I burned along with all my poetry because I watched <laughs> the doors and uh, I thought Jim Morrison had something going on but well, if well, he could do it well, yeah I mean I think your fate has uh, turned out to be better than Jim Morrison's but um yeah I mean mine's not not that different really like of course you know as a teenager I loved music and like all those crazy writers who were taking drugs and seemed cool and whatnot I think there was something earlier in my life like I was raised a Catholic and I had a very liberal Catholic upbringing and I forgive you yeah <laughs> thanks I mean in in my world in in the fa- in the family that I was brought up with it was more the plowshares common wheel end of Catholicism where like it was helping the poor and, you know, everybody's going to be in heaven, metaphysical body of Christ. My dad, on the other hand, he's an arch atheist. So I grew up in this household where I had on one hand, this kind of like very leftist Catholic imagination. 
that was super expansive, right? So in that in that world, everything is imbued with Christ, like rocks, plants, people. And in that way, there is no difference between the inside and the outside. There's no, everything is part of one body. And then my dad, who not not only was he an arch atheist, he like, lit, I think he hates religion. Right. Or, and um, so he, but he. Wow, like, what a household that would be. Yeah, and like many people who hate things, he's really just obsessed with it, right. you know. Um, and he probably thinks about it more than anybody I know in a weird way, like Christopher Hitchens yeah. kind of style. Well, he he loved Christopher Hitchens naturally. Right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Uncle Chris. <laughs> so he he would always be watching programs like uh, about religion, and in I guess the late eighties. There was the power of myth with Joseph Campbell and Bill Moyers. It was on PBS, mm. and it was about you know the world religions and like the Joseph Campbell is the here with a thousand faces author of that book, which is the sort of book that undergirds most of Hollywood movies. It tells you the journey of the hero, right? So there was one moment where he Campbell talked about the poets being the closest to the mystics, to, that, that it was a spiritual calling. Yes, and that stuck with me, and I think. Then I was into art and all of those sorts of things as a high schooler and listening to Kurt Cobain and everybody else. Heck yeah. Uh, uh, Early 90s. And, yeah, just like you. Yeah. I mean, we were doing it in the same valley. And when I went to university, I should say that my dad's a real blue collar guy. He came from an immigrant Dutch blue collar family. So I was the first person in his side of the family to go to university. And in my first year creative writing class, there was a teacher called Patrick Lane. And he looked just like my dad. Turned out he'd never even finished high school, but he had become a poet and he'd won, you know, all these awards and was a famous poet. So he, back then that was all you needed to be a university teacher. That kind of opened up and just, it opened the door to the possibility that I could, that a, a poet was a thing you could be. Mm-hmm. Like I'd never met one. Like or, No, absolutely not. Or like, yeah, I, or I wasn't aware of that that's who I was meeting. And maybe. at the time, there wasn't any like traveling slam poets or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, so. I mean, I think there were people who were doing that. We just weren't, you know, we didn't have access to it growing up in totally in the northern sticks Vancouver here. Island, you know. And so I thought, oh, Patrick, there's a, there's a thing called a poet. And, and also a poet could be a man just like my dad. My dad, the mm. arch atheist, who is a working class blue galler truck driver, crane operator. And that stuck with me. And like, none of these things weren't, weren't moments where I was like, oh, I'm just going to be a poet. They were things that I think now when I look back, they're how I make sense of the story. And I went through university, wanted to graduate my, <laughs> I didn't really have a plan, uh, huh. how, how to graduate university. And when I went in my third year and said, well, how do I get out of here? Uh, they said, well, it looks like you could do a creative writing degree. You probably have enough to do a creative writing degree. So I did that. And it was only after I finished university, went to Vancouver, and I thought, I wonder what it would be like to actually try to be a poet. And I had started reading and writing and attending readings and like meeting people. And it turns out exactly how you do any other business. Right. You know, like you go and you shake hands with people and you get their names and you call them up and you seek advice and you lend a hand whenever there's a possibility to pitch in. So I spent years working on editorial magazines and doing reading series and like doing all those kinds of cultural legwork, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, did you, at that time, did you also run into a mentor, kind of like a Sean Connery character (laughs) who kind of walked you through creative writing and kind of got you inspired or pushed you in some kind of direction? So I think that that's one thing that's really nice about the writing community in Canada especially is that there are it's a generally a very welcoming community and people really do want to help each other I think this is true especially in poetry partly because there's really no commercial value in it right it's a it's a thing you do because it's a way of being in the world and Mm -hmm. like now I'm a university professor I've been doing that for 16 years and I have a like this view of what a young poet might be like. And so I can see myself now in a better way through the eyes of the older poets that I met. So I had some, I had folks like Bill A. Nickerson who teaches at uh, Kwantlen. He's not that much older than me, but he has, had been around enough to know things. So he took me aside one day to the foundation in Vancouver to have f- chocolate fondue and to te- tell me about how you do your taxes as an artist. You know, like 
I love, I love that one. That yeah. to me as well, that was mentor's first advice was like, we got to get your taxes straight. Yeah. It's like it's so funny. And it's so great to have, Oh, that's a thing that you need to think about. Cause I was not even on my mind. Like n- not something that I clocked at all. And then there were lots of folks like Russell Thornton, who's a poet in North Vancouver, who um, I'm still in touch with quite a bit. Yeah. What's his popular book? You, he had a, he had a book. Well, there's House Built of Rain and the Human Shore, and there's one with a whole bunch of um, birds, metal, stones, and rain, I think is another one. Yeah. And uh, he w- he w- he won a, f- or was nominated for a bunch of awards. For yeah, that. a Griffin Prize, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was The Hundred Lives, I think that was right. one. So Russell came from a similar kind of background than I did, uh, and he's 10 or so years older than me. And he was kind of like, like, when I got my first book contract, he knew the editor of that, uh, and he said, when you are so fed up with this guy and you just want to like throw in the towel because this has, is a thing that happens to writers, especially at the beginning, like you butt heads with your editors and whatnot. He said, just phone, he, here's my phone number, phone me. Don't do anything, just phone me. So I phoned Russell because uh, like, it happened. I was like, oh, this is the moment. I guess I have to call Russ. And so those were like the kind of, there are many other, many, many other things. Michael V. Smith was really important. He teaches with me in a UBC Okanagan. Uh, Don Mackay, who was the poetry organizer at the Banff Center, he was super important. Lorna Crozier, who was Patrick Lane's wife, and she also taught at UVic, she was huge for me in, in doing all kinds of like, she wrote me reference letters, but they were also, there's also just the times where like somebody would say, oh, Lorna said I should read your book, or I should read your poems, you know, hmm. that kind of like word of mouth thing that comes from a older poet that helps you in your career. So I'm telling you the story of like how I got to be spending yeah. time writing and, and, and having a career, but it's only kind of maybe in the last like few years that I realized that the career thing is kind of like the form content thing in art. Like the career was the form that allowed me to write poems. So I found like, oh, this is how you do it. You teach here, you go to this residency, you go to grad school. I had wonderful experience at the University of Oregon where they paid for everything and taught me, they gave me a year's teacher training and I had amazing mentors uh, in that grad program. Are they the beavers? Uh, The ducks. The ducks. Yeah. (laughs) I love it, man. Yeah. So uh, all of that stuff let me be, be, like have a life that let me raise a family and, you know, now, now I like, my mom lives downstairs and so I own this home with my mom and I like, help her out because I'm in that kind of, as I think you are too, in a bit of a sandwich place, you know, with kids on one side and uh, older parents on the other side. It's bananas. <laughs> but it's also a real blessing to be able to do that and like to be able to have, I mean, I think it's just kind of amazing to be able to. Having your grandparents close by when you have kids is so magical, I think. Yeah. I get to see a side of my parents that I never saw or appreciated and how they are with my kids. I don't know if it's the same for you, but it's just such a different approach. And I can almost see the gentleness and the tenderness that maybe I missed Mm -hmm. and didn't register even though it was there. Yeah, I've come to appreciate my parents' parenting so much more after watching them with my own kids. It's so true. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche to say that's like, you know, Dads are often better grandfathers than they were fathers, you know. Um, yeah, but yeah, like my that relationship between my kids and their grandparents is really special. But I think even just the proximity of being near somebody aging and getting to see my mom age and become an old woman and like in the most beautiful way yeah. is uh, super interesting. Like for a long time, I was really curious, like what I would think when I was older. I was like, I wonder what I'll think about this when I'm 40, when I wonder what I'll think when I'm 60. I thought maybe that it would, you would acquire new knowledge. Right. And I think it's less that you acquire new knowledge, or at least this is my impression. And from talking with my mom is there's a tone or a cast of light to what you know that nothing but time will deliver. Mm. Like you can't get there any other way. That's um, a really nice thought. I like that. Yeah. And I would agree. It seems, seems true in my life, and it's just really remarkable to watch hmm. uh, a person like arrive in their full wisdom. And uh, yeah, I see for my father especially, he has changed so much, more so since 
we've left home, he's done a 180. Like I wouldn't even recognize him. Although the people that have known him his whole life are like, yeah, that's Jim. He's like a very (laughs) playful and hyper interested person. Like he goes so deep down the rabbit hole on topics that and stays there. Like, and just lives there. And I never saw that as a kid because, of course, he was working all the time and just busy and then angry on the weekends. It kind of, it kind of reminds me of my own, I totally, my own self, like parenting. I really appreciate what he was going through, I think, mentally. And also, you know, you're dealing with these huge transitions of being a male, of aging male. It's such a weird experience, I think. (laughs) <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it is weird. Well, I mean, it, this is exactly the thing we don't know. And we realize, of course, that our parents had no idea either. When we were kids, like they were just yeah. as bewildered as we are. Yeah. And I think like I watching my mom, it's not that she knows new things. She's just so much more comfortable with that bewilderment, like with that, mm. like not knowing. It does get exciting. And this is the like nub of the thing that I wanted to say about poems is that it's not all of that stuff about how you uh, make your way in the social world to have the moniker of poet has really nothing to do with being a poet. Like you could be a poet and have a job driving truck. You could be a poet and do anything, right? Like there's not, the heart of that poetry is, is really that attention to the confusion that is sometimes, confusion is almost too negative a word, but like that mystery, the unknowing, the strangeness, the traveling to alien places, you know, the spaceship. And Mm -hmm. my mom never, ever gave me any grief about the choice to be a writer. Yeah. And that's amazing. And like, that was a, just a sheer, that was a stroke of luck. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably, I have, she has a brother who is an artist. And so my uncle Frank is an artist and he ran away when he was a young man to Italy to become a theater mask maker. That's and deadly. I think it. That's he, that's even crazier than be, becoming a poet. I think I think the story that the the legend is he went and knocked on the door of this mask maker and wanted to apprentice, you know, uh, which is just crazy. But I think my mom had seen Frank make his way in the world, so she knew that it was possible. You know that like you could. Uh, you know, after hearing the story of Daniel Day Lewis, mm-hmm. Academy Award winning actor. Yeah doing all these films. He's revered as one of the greats. World was his oyster. He just left it all and knocked on a door in, I think in Italy, of some cobbler and learned how to make shoes. Yeah. It's, it is like, I have to respect that so much. To me, that's poetry. Yeah. I mean, making shoes is poetry. Like that's, if you can't see the poetry in that, then you'll be, Good luck with the rest of it, you know? And just like the dead, like just being like, no, I have everything, but it's not giving me any, it's not feeding me. And then just doing that and disappearing. Yeah. And like, I think he's got a family and stuff, but it's, it's just amazing. It's that being unattached, right? Mm -hmm. You know, unattached to this version of yourself that was created by the past, right? In being with, uh, yourself in the present, which is also, I think that something that my experience of my health has brought me, like there is really, it's really hard to not be in the present when you are constantly facing sort of moral challenges. Like we were, you know, uh, when you feel good, you might as well feel good, you know, (laughs) and let yourself feel good. Yeah. That's what I mean. It is difficult to do. Yeah. So for some reason in this society, it is difficult to do. Um, but because your early childhood, you had some health issues. Yeah, all my life, I, I've had a, what's called atopic syndrome. It's a cluster of allergies and inflamed sinuses and skin. So I had fairly profound allergies and asthma that landed me in the hospital regularly, often to get adrenaline and then sent home. The last time that happened to me was January of 2020. So... It still happens somewhat, I wouldn't say regularly, but it happens all the time and I kind of have to pay a lot of attention to it. Right. Uh, uh, you get you very used to it, right? So you it blends into, it's just part of your life and you forget 
you don't necessarily forget about it, but its profoundness can be dulled. Yes. Uh, in some ways. And I, I, I really think, understand. I know you do. I know you really understand exactly what I'm saying. It's part of why I wanted to talk with you. You know, um, I think there's some lesson in that dullness, which has to do with on some level, everything is the same. Like there is no profoundness about facing death or walking back into life. Like they're all the same on, on one level, like on a spiritual level, obviously on a social family level that, you know, or the narrative of your life, it's not that way. But I think thinking about it that way can give some space to not let, not let the the fear control you not let the like illness be the dominating feature of your life. Right. Yeah. It's, it's because you were hooked to like in one of your poems or a bunch of them, actually, you refer to being hooked up to a breathing machine. Yes. And is that true? Yeah. Well, like I said on a, uh, no, it's not true. I made it all up. Yes. I, well, I don't know. No, it's true. A creator. Sometimes, sometimes in the poems you do make things up, so I shouldn't, uh, mm-hmm. I shouldn't make light of that. But um, And not always autobiographical no. in nature. So Yeah, not always autobiographical in nature and not always... Um, it could the, be metaphorical yeah, for or something. Sometimes you need to change the name of the river because it's better to call it the Mad River than the Puntledge River or whatever, you know? Yeah, totally. Uh, I get you. Or the other weird thing is sometimes you have to change things in writing so that people will believe it's real. Mm-hmm. Because if you, if you put it in the way it actually is, nobody will believe that. It doesn't seem quite right. Mm. Um, but back to the breathing thing, yeah. So I, I still use it, not every day, but... I have like a nebulizer. It's basically uh, like an air compressor that uh, vaporizes steroids and bronchodilators uh, so that I can open my lungs up with the minimal amount of like lung capacity. Mm. So when I was a kid, that was twice a day, every day. Wow. For about half an hour. That's a lot of time to think as a kid. Yeah. I mean, I think I watched a lot of G.I. Joe probably as a kid, but yeah. Didn't we all? Yeah. And then even like when we would travel... We had one that plugged into the lighter of the in the car, you know, so that if we were on a long road trip or whatever. My dad was a truck driver for a long time when I was a kid, and so sometimes I would go with him. Right. Um, and we, I remember sitting in truck stop bathrooms, like in Bakersfield, California, or someplace like that, and sitting on my nebulizer, just like you, know, you can imagine, like this sort of steam rising all around me, and with a sort of like Darth Vader mask on. And my dad would read me Treasure Island or something like that. And I remember watching the truck drivers kind of, I could tell they were listening to the, my dad reading these stories. Like it was just, that was just part of how it was. It was twice a day, every day for years and years and years. It's probably until my teenage years. My neighbor is, has been building his house for about three years. Yeah, and we can hear that. Every single day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's a gorgeous house. This is, is what it sounds like every yeah. <laughs> day. Uh, so I apologize for that. There's a lot to unpack as far as like your influences. And, you know, as a kid, I came to a really early understanding. I think it was about five or six. I had chronic nightmares. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of my my burden as a kid, I had this like wild imagination. I was very independent as a kid. And so I ran around the property. I spent a lot of time in the forest. My parents just kind of left me alone. Like I got up in the morning and came home at night and yeah, totally. And uh, often I was lighting fires and having a fire outside and my parents would just kind of, and I'd, they'd come and get me and I'd be falling asleep outside yeah. next to the fire or that for me was a childhood and I realized more and more as I have my own kids, like they're petrified to go outside or they don't have that yeah. same opportunity and I don't even know how to give them that opportunity. I, I know exactly. I, my childhood is almost identical. Like I would do this. Yeah. Medic, this, this I mean, we grew in up morning. in exactly yeah. the same place, I should say. Yeah. Um, for me, my independence actually has become the thing that I'm trying to let go of. It's the value that I'm trying to let go of because I've discovered that independence is only good if you're trying to find somebody. That's the only time you should deploy it. Sure. I, th- I feel like it's okay to be dependent on people. It's okay to share a connection. And what I'm finding as I get older is that 
connections hold magic and could be a connection with an object. It could be a connection with a person, but I want to create more opportunities for magic. And that is kind of my whole MO now during the day Yeah, is like, how do I connect with things to get the juice? It's funny because I, I think all whole time I've known you, I, I would have said that that was what you were about. Um, like it maybe didn't feel that way to you entirely. That, well, I don't think I could articulate yeah. what it was, but I was doing it anyways. Yeah. Yeah. You, for, for sure. It's, well, I would, I would talk about it as relationship, you know, like in, in respect for that, um, space between you and whatever it is you've encountered, you know, um, whether that's a person who is made of stone or a person who is made of wood or a person who is made of human flesh or the person of the stars, whatever, I would like to grant all of the beings that I encounter their full mind, you know, their full presence in the, in the world and not more importantly than my own. I was interested in two things you said that I, I wanted to ask you about whether you still, you, you were talking about having all these nightmares and, and yeah, not, and I wanted to ask you if you still dream and like what kinds of, like do you still have wild dreams? Tons. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I had chronic nightmares up until at the age 25, I want to say. And then, then I started, um, so what I learned through that process, thank you for bringing me back to that when I was six was, uh, I kind of had to make my peace with the world and the universe at a very early age because every night I went to bed, I thought I was going to die. Mm-hmm. And that became, we grew up in a secular household, so mm-hmm. I had no religion in my household, but not atheistic either. It just was more agnostic. Nobody cared. Yeah. That's how it seemed. Turns out my father is religious and practices on his own, but never put that on me ever. Right. And so I appreciate that. And I think it, I think it's a part of his mystery as well to me. But that idea of like coming to grips with waking up in the middle of the night, thinking your room is going to devour you Mm -hmm. and making the conscious decision that I'm too proud to wet the bed. Mm. I'm going to get up and do this. Even if it costs me my life, I'm going to use the bathroom Mm -hmm. because I'm not, um, I was never a bedwetter, but I guess I was very stubborn. Yeah. And motivated that even if it was going to kill me, I was going to do it. And decisions that I have to take in order to move my life forward and not be stuck under the covers. Yes. That sounds to me like a, you know, a child's way of, of, um, approaching the, these pro the, the, the condition that we find ourselves in all throughout our life, which now for me looks more like, Oh, I have a sense of disappointment. I wonder what it would be like to sit with my disappointment and see what, you know, what kind of gate that is, like what's on the other side of the disappointment or what's on the other side of this fear or what's on the other side of this jealousy rather than run away from it or like hide, stay under the covers. Yeah. And that's just what it looks like for me at 43. That's what it sounds like when you tell that story to me. So as that progressed and very early on I had, and I've talked about this in previous podcasts Mm -hmm. with Wedley Speck, I was visited in the night by bears Mm -hmm. and bears always talked to me and were kind of, um, would check me. And if I was feeling some kind of a fear in everyday life, bears would come and almost give me context of the fear Mm -hmm. And then it would make life during the day a breeze. Yeah. And so that's why I've always like tried to connect with nature and be outside as much as possible because I wanted to understand not my current day, but my dreams. And, and so it's like living to understand my dreams and it became a big part. I mean, I carried that easily into my early twenties and a lot of my transition from engineering and math and, you know, things that I was good at that I hated and didn't understand why to be able to let those go and move into Mm -hmm. more of an artistic space. And this is why creativity and artistic endeavors and more the journey of the mind has always captivated me 
because of the dreams and because of the narratives and stories, ultimately, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of how we connect and how we perceive the world, that pursuit actually is kind of like the final frontier for me of like what I'm trying to get to, if that makes sense, that I love artistic expression and I love the creativity. I've never really been able to fully commit because I feel like I've overcommitted my value system to parenthood and real world endeavors to take care of things. And this is my huge conflict in life is parenthood to me is very important to do it as do it a certain way subconsciously. Right. I I have all the social stigmas attached to it. I have like what a good dad is. I have all these ideas that I'm telling myself about how to be a good parent. And at the same time it's like Like I'm trading a huge chunk of my energy to fulfill these constructions Mm -hmm. that I've made for myself. And I have a really hard time walking away from those and just kind of letting them be. And I think actually I've come to the point where I'm like, my kids suffer for that. Mm. Yeah. Like it's a, it's becoming a negative thing and and I'm not giving them the expression of myself of what I am I'm giving them a construction of what I think a good dad should be what do you think of that Matt I I think that you're probably not as it's not as absolute as that even in your own life right like you know that you're giving them many of those things of yourself like this is a that's a certain mind state talking to you about yourself that is not always the, the case right and I mean, we all struggle. Like, that's not actually, I mean, we're all doing, you know, we get caught up in the story. Totally. You know, all these other stories. But they're not any more real than anything else. I w- I'm curious about the the dream, real world distinction you m- make, because my own sense of things as I've matured is that they're actually not two different worlds. It's all one entangled, continuous world. And... There are ways in that I experience this world as being less real than the dream world. Like there are times when I think this is just as crazy and strange and very uh, much so. I understand that uh, to me, they're still delineated uh, because my lives are completely different in my dream space. But they, all, all of this is related because it's related to your the story you're telling yourself about being a parent and w- which stories or which mind states you have in your waking life access to and that you're giving privilege to in this story, you know, uh, what perspectives you're taking, which I know, I just know are not how you're actually living your life most of the time with your kids, right? For my own, I have two daughters, and I remember when I had, when Neela was born for years, I like, I I love you more than anything, like, and I really meant this, you know, like, I really meant it not in the sense that I would sacrifice the earth for my daughter, but I meant it like there was no love that could surpass this love, which of course you realize is the source of all love in all things. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And then you have this other kid and you're like, wait, I also love you more than anything. Um, So now you have the paradox of like total excess, like you can't, and how can it be that you have two people that you love more than anything and not less than each other or greater than each other? It feels like a pool and I tell my kids, it's like my love is a cup and you're in it. Yeah. You're in the middle floating around and swimming in that and it's one thing. Yeah. And it's endless. Yeah. Yeah. But then I, you think, okay, if, if that love is endless, then all things are in it. Right. Not just the kids. So how do you open yourself to. Which is that business of like the creative part or the, or the part where you're, you're, you're loving your kids. That experience is the biggest form of creation that I know Mm -hmm. like that like that experience of love like that's all it is and it's a similar one that activates your the child Zach to be brave it's activates the slightly older Zach to recognize the bears for the gifts that for like the these helper beings that are coming to you Mm -hmm. that are actually you Mm -hmm. and everything else and like all that's within you because you're within everything else you know uh, it it gets a little trippy there, but uh, that's that's what poetry is. That's the heart of the poetry. And that's why sometimes creative writing classes don't, I think creative writing classes are creative writing classes and writing poetry is writing poetry. Poetry could happen in a creative writing class, but 
Not everything that happens in that class is poetry. Not every book you pick up that's marketed as poetry. The marketing of poetry has really very little to do with it being a poem. Right. Um, yeah. You know, in thinking about poetry, I really think of it as discovery. The thing that really propels me as well is that kind of finding of the the magic balls, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. For me, discovery is that moment where you go, ah, oh, you feel it. Yeah. You feel the magic or there's something going on and time blurs and the ego falls away and you're wrapped in childhood emotion, like of just sure. base level bliss, if totally. for lack of a better description. I think in going through, you know, we were talking about health and kind of your journey through the dream world really ties in. Recently, I've been having heart issues for the last, since I was 16, right. that were misdiagnosed and uh, I've had now waiting for my third ablation, which is a uh, where they put little lasers and a and a camera up into your heart, and they do a bunch of burning and probing and shocking and all this kind of stuff. It's really amazing. But part of my problem is that my body is healing too well, mm. and so they're going in there and damaging things that they want to stop. And what's happening is my body is healing them. <laughs> and so this condition keeps coming back. It's really stubborn. It's a weird feeling to have your piece of your body, my heart in my case, trying to kill me. And what is my relationship now with, with my body and this thing that I'm carrying? But also it's giving me a really interesting perspective into the, that daily journey of mindfulness and also it's forcing the mindfulness. This is not something that is optional. If I want to be living, yes. this is like, you're doing this. And that condition is fascinating and really taught me so much and made it actually easier to be mindful. It's suddenly like, nope, that's just how it is. And then going to the hospital, you know, I'm in there every couple of weeks. You know, if my heart goes out of rhythm for it's usually over 24 hours. I've been pushing it lately to 48. But I can, in theory, go into heart failure because my heart rate is so high. It's, you know, it could be 150 beats a minute for 48 hours. Wow. So that's like running full tilt, totally. essentially. That's, that's uh, crazy. Yeah, for 48 it hours. It's, it is exhausting, yeah. And I don't get all the benefits of like the, yeah. muscle, <laughs> the muscular growth. <laughs> But, you know, showing up at the hospital, going through that process, thank goodness they are so kind and so wonderful to me, but nobody trusts me either. And I know that the medical system, people have issues with that, like, oh, I don't feel trusted or I'm not cared for, blah, 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 blah. When I go in there, I live so cleanly now. Like I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do any, I I don't even eat, I watch my salt. You know, I'm just like living like a monk. And I'm not even walking, like I'm not doing exercise because I can't, mm. right? It'll, it'll trip it out. So the thing that sets it off is my kids, right? Right? Like when they're fighting or when there's some stress, that is the only trigger or of, of you know, not correlation, but actual causation that I can, can find for this thing. So I have this real weird relationship growing of in my parenting, you know, and parenthood. And, and then they bring me into the emergency room. They get me a room right away. If you have chest pains, man, they're working on you like immediately. And so I get into the room. It's become a ritual. I even have a bag. I have um, noise canceling headphones that I bring with me. Mm-hmm. I have my phone. I usually get a movie queued up, ready to go because I'm going to be waiting a lot and I'm in agony and I just kind of want to pull my head away from it. I uh, get that started. They come in, they do a blood test right away because they want to see if I'm drinking, smoking, drunk, taking drugs, all this stuff. And they ask me all the same questions. Are you doing that? And I say no. And they're like, oh, we'll see. And then they go away. And there is kind of a cynicism in the ER. Then I get the IV. This is another person. There's usually five people on the team. And then they get my bed comfortable you know, I'm hanging up stuff like, yeah, I'm like setting, you know, I bring a picture, you know, put the picture up like it's just making a little house in your in your space and kind of controlling it. Mm-hmm. 
I have indigenous friends that uh, are, I'm become very cultural. I'm very excited about it and, and doing like cultural learnings and my own educational journey in that regard, like working with elders and yes. them teaching me working spirituality. And they've said any time you're having an issue and you're in the ER and you need us, full regalia we're coming in hot yeah it's just gonna be drums and this and that so cool we will put you in whatever headspace you need to be in just having that confidence in my community Mm -hmm. has been the biggest gift that i've ever received this externalized love is just there right to access i can just walk and eat it like a piece of fruit that's poetry yeah, it's amazing. Those, those folks who want to like know that you heal from your whole body. You don't heal just from what they put in your arm. My condition is my mind. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's completely a, a mental, spiritual affliction. Right. I have a broken heart, yeah, you know? totally. And then I get this team that comes in. Usually there's a doctor. There's a, a locum, like a student doctor, because UBC yeah. has, yeah. it's a student hospital. And a uh, two nurses, which are always really funny. Oh, and then an RT. So they put give mm-hmm. me the uh, respiratory technician, gives me the oxygen. I get, I love that. I love pure oxygen. It's like my favorite. <laughs> he cranks it up. I have a team. They put me under. They shoot me up with uh, a mix of seventy to seventy uh, propofol and ketamine. Wow. Then I hit the K hole. You have crazy dreams and crazy noises. Noise, mm-hmm. noise is the big one. And so this last time I went in, I had earplugs and I was going to test my, this is where it's come to though, the ban- yeah. banality of yeah. this process. So I get to, you know, go on these trips across the universe with a team taking care of me, making sure I'm breathing and making sure I'm safe and comfortable and hydrated. And then they electrocute me. Until my heart goes back into rhythm. Now I'm telling them, you know, start at 200, give me 300, go to 400 if that doesn't work. And then I usually wake up with being in rhythm. I feel pretty good because coming out of Mm -hmm. propofol and ketamine, actually you feel Mm -hmm. really good and it clears your system quite quickly. Uh, But I get burns on my chest and my back from the paddles, like electrical burns. So they're really itchy. But the actual experience of going that deep into the the K-hole, if you will, I have to really focus and anchor. And it's not, for me, I have to let go of any aggressiveness of like, I'm going into this, you know, like, and I'm going right. to win this. Like, there's no winning. Yeah. Um, so it's l- letting go in the purest sense of everything, but then anchoring myself around one thought. Yes. And that thought will carry me through that journey. Mm-hmm. And if you let go of it, it's like uh, if anyone's seen Interstellar when they're going through the wormhole, yes. it's, it's exactly like that. It's like stay in the ship. Yes. Or, or there's all the things that are trying to pull them, you know, like he's. This is what I think the, you know, meditators like who have done it for a long time. It's that it's your ability to attend to hold on, to attend to one thing and just stay there, despite all the things that are, this is what I mean when I say about, don't run away from my disappointment, just I need to stay, go right into that place and have the full feeling Mm -hmm. and go right through it. It's not, and I think you're right, it can be very dangerous. You could get lost. There's sort of infinite uh, lateral space on the way down, right? I've grown a tremendous amount of empathy for seniors or dementia patients or my first, my, my initial reaction is how do I make this experience better for other people? Yes, that's, that's exactly right. This is the thing that uh, I wanted to say earlier when you started telling the story about your mindfulness and like that you didn't have a choice. This is what uh, they, they say about awakening, right? Like once you have awoken, your choices are either fight that that wakefulness. You can spend a lot of energy trying to not be awake, which some people do. It takes a terrible toll on you. It's like the red pill and the blue yeah. pill. But now you just you're there. Like you got. I mean, that's where the red pill and the blue pill come from. Like they come totally. from this. Like you know, for thousands of years, people have known this. 
Yeah. Um, and once once you have see, glimpsed it, you can't unglimpse it. No. Like, and you you just have to go with it. And it's why fight it. Like, mm-hmm. there's no, there's nothing to be it's, gained from that. You know, it's really crazy though. There's also this pull mm-hmm. into that world where call it awakening. I mean, I, yeah, I don't but, know what that is, but. No, no, but, nobody knows what any of these words mean. They're just like things. Yeah. They're like signposts. They're like, if you've walked down that road, you'll know when you see it. Totally. So if I throw that word up and we could just call it like uh, kettleball and we're like, oh yeah, kettleball, you know, like it doesn't really matter. So there is also a danger on the other, on this side of things when much like, you know, mm-hmm. the story of Buddha is sitting under the tree for whatever it was, mm-hmm. 60 or 80 days or something like that. Um, for me, I find it has such an allure. It is so powerful that I want to be there. I want to Mm. be in that state constantly. And this is the journey, the supernatural journey, uh, the spiritual journey, learning to navigate in that universe. The other thing that comes with that is the spirit world and the monsters that live there. Are you ready to talk to that? Mm-hmm. is is the other question I'm asking myself because like you mentioned it's never ending it's infinite I feel like I'm at the beginning of the universe you know what I mean like I've gone yes. through the wormhole and there I am but there's another universe behind that and the thing that I have to fight is you can't be in that world all the time you need to parent you need to cook dinner right. you need to push the grocery cart and that 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 mundane uh I don't know if it's a word mundanity mundanity yeah, yeah. mundanity something like maybe neither of us are saying it correctly I or don't know. banality i don't yeah. know let's go with that <laughs> but you know that is the the poet's journey too yeah so i think that i can tell you i'm projecting no no I that's think, what it is <laughs> I, I think that uh i think that, you know like my the, the comment about a, uh, awake awakening is it is it you know that's a word the word in it is just a signpost that either you know those signposts or you don't. Like you're either traveling down that road or you're not. Like, um, you know, we teach poetry in this way that like we can decode it and like get to its real meaning, but it's a lot more nebulous than that. It's sort of like the way we talk about relationships and people we fall in love with and like all the things that a relationship is supposed to do. But anybody who's been in a relationship for a long time knows it either works or it doesn't. Like that's, and that's kind of ineffable. How I can tell this whole story about my own health is like, you know, you were talking about the broken heart and like the mind, spirit, body connection. You know, a way to talk about my health problems are that my body's oversensitive or even not oversensitive. It's just extremely alert to the world and it wants to respond to everything with like its full presence. Right. And it's just triggered by everything. Yeah. Like everything is so much. Um, Hmm. And so one of the ways that I think I talk to my body, I I, I think about it more like the body at some point it was useful for my skin to react that way when I touched wheat or something. And I think, okay, we don't need it to do that anymore. So how do I say to my body, okay, thanks so (laughs) much for your, for looking after me. Right. But you know, I got this, this is not a problem anymore. We are, we're, we're good. Let's go focus on something else. This is the thing about the mindfulness that starts to get weird. You're like, okay, if I'm my body, but my body, I also have a relationship with my body. And then I'm thinking, and then I'm watching myself think, who's doing the watching? And like, you start to, the diffuseness of the self becomes a very strange uh, experience. Do you, do you just start drinking at that point? Well, I, like you, I don't drink anymore either. <laughs> <Whoops>. <laughs> What I wanted to say about this, the the allure of that place, though, um, mm. you know, like when I first started meditating, I would have these experiences where they were so, they felt so good. They were terrifying. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm an, if I go there, I'm, that's like death. Like, I'm not coming back from that. Oh, okay. You know, like, it was so good that, like, why would you ever want to be anywhere else? I know. Uh, I know. But... Something happened around that time where I started to realize that my experience of writing was the same as my experience of, of meditating. Like when I write, I don't eat, drink, experience time. It just goes 
And, you know, my family has gotten used to me, like, getting up in the middle of a meal without saying anything and just, like, disappearing. Because once I'm into it, I'm so into it that I... It's like a flow state. Like, I can't go back. I can't sleep. I can't... I'm so thankful that you have a family that would support that. Because <laughs> yeah. that happens to me all the time. Yeah. And they don't support it. They're like, <laughs> uh, come on back. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you need... The, the, it's good for them to call you back. It's like, actually, right now, you need to... But this gets us to the question of like, are those places different? Is the dream world different? Is this world different? Is that place? And I started thinking about it more like, what can I bring back from that world to this world? Which is a lot like what you talk about when you go to talk to the bears and like, oh, okay, that helps me in this world. What what is a meditative state except for deep attention and complete awareness? Mm. You're like, you attend to one thing which tells you, Let's your awareness roam and that awareness tells you how to attend to that thing even more. You have all of those. And that's what you're experiencing when you're experiencing that total love of your children, right? Like, yeah. um, and so I think of poetry as being like the emissary from that world. This is what I can tell you about what it was like, you know, what it's like in that. When I let that world come into uh, this one, I had this realization that sometimes your realizations are so obvious that they, like the most surprising things are all the things that are like just so obvious. Like how do do you not know this already? But I remember a couple of years ago standing in a meadow uh, above the Okanagan Valley looking at an aster, which is the same word as star. They 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 come from the Greek word for star. And I thought, okay, I can look at this aster and I can see the star in the sky. And I can imagine the thing in my mind. And I haven't traveled anywhere. Like I'm literally in the same place. But all of those places are, are like unified. Yes. And uh, You allude to this, and we'll get into your mm-hmm. writing. I think it's a good segue. You allude to this in the poem, Garlic. Oh, yes. So let's hear that poem. Garlic. You rise from the garden swinging a bulb of garlic like a thurible or a lantern. Here's the small light, its filament of purple you kept earthed all winter. A sensor cloven yet bundled together. Later I peel the skin from two fleshy moons and crush them. In the black skillet, iron. Sulfur, oil spitting like a meteor shower. With a sprig of parsley between your teeth, you breathe in my ear. Take me firmly in your hand. Through the open work of your body comes a pomander of photons and water. What passes through me with a shudder. Time, heat. A vision of a star yanked free from the night, dirty with loamy sky. I love that last line, you know, plucking the star. Right. From the, from the, the loamy sky. From the loamy sky. Yeah. I, I learned some of this from, there's a writer, mystic kind of character uh, called Harold Renich, who many people who have like followed BC writers for years will know Harold. Uh, Harold was, he's in his 60s and he was taught by Robin Skelton, who started the creative writing program at um, UVic, and Robin Skelton was a literal witch. Like, he was into Wiccan and all kinds of oh, stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, so... Okay. Uh, he, and he taught um, Harold, and Harold's a bit of a self-styled kind of puck character, you know, like a bit of a trickster traveling between the the, the, the edges of things, you know? And... And he told me that uh, one of his realizations about looking at the world was that he could see patterns. The, the, the idea of pulling a garlic out of the dirt, and you're like, okay, I have this white thing that came from this dark thing. It's the same pattern as like the, sky, the stars and the dark thing. And, and all you have to do is put those two things together. Like the more you pay attention to these rhymes, these, these things that look the same around, you start to wonder how many things are there really like maybe there are fewer discrete things than we think that they're all 
actually interrelated, right. entangled aspects of expressions of each other. Everyone's seen a like a a map and seen the rivers on the map and how mm-hmm. they look like veins in your body yeah. or like there's all these patterns like you're yeah. saying. Yeah, this is exactly the thing which makes me think about that comment you made about independence yes. versus connection, which is again really it's not it's not that you realize that you don't want to be independent, it's that you realize that you never really were. Right. Like you were never independence is only a mind state yes. in relation to yes. things that are all you you were never uh, on your own. And that's why I was felt safe mm-hmm. in those by the fire or by mm-hmm. with with the trees or talking to the ravens mm-hmm. or whatever it was that day. Totally. That you are connected in many ways. Yeah. It's it's funny to fight it though, to say, No, I'm an independent man and I can do this and I can get through anything and I can do all these things. And it's a futile thing because in fact you're actually just shutting yourself off it's, in that pursuit. It's like, I'm not listening yeah. to anything. You alluded to, to this earlier about parenting, that like that's part of uh, the culture of colonial settler Western culture in North America. Uh, that's one of its expressions. Yes. Is, and especially for men, yes. uh, especially for white men, but I think not just white men. Good looking white men. <laughs> I think for all men who are exposed to that culture, what almost of whichever background, cultural background, they like of origin they may have, if you grow up in the bombarded by the hegemony of the Western culture, we take up those myths and those stories. And of course, there's a double sided thing to it, which is that in some level, it's the ability to recognize that you don't have to, that you can go it alone. You don't have to go with the dominant culture that lets you rec- see that you are in fact connected. As with many things, even in the dominant culture, not all of it is poison. Some of it is, there's wisdom in even that, you know, um, that is a matter of seeing its pattern, its connections. How, how does it l- like these other things that are life-giving, you know? Um, back, you asked me about the poet, poetry, and I started with the Catholicism, and I'm not a Catholic, and I'm, I'm not particularly religious, and for a long time, I, I didn't even say I was agnostic because I just didn't even wonder. I had nothing, although now I think I'm quite spiritual, and I, like, sometimes I, I, have, I go to Mass with my mom. Which is awesome. Yeah, and, like, it, well, it has its moments. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I have to admit to being, like, completely appalled by the politics, uh, Oh, of enough, course, yeah. Like, to the, but, but, but going through mass and going through ritual is um, ritual to me is is awesome. Well, this is what I, I was going to say. Like, the, there are those things that that rhyme with the stuff that I know is uh, life giving, right? And um, writing poems and writing, learning the history of poem making and the craft of poem making um, is a ritual, and there are like. There are aspects yeah. of, of the poem making real formal things down to the syllable and the syllable's relation to the next syllable and where it falls on the page and all of the, those things. They give you objects to attend to so your awareness can get bigger so that you can um, bring from all of those dimensions into this social dimension where language pertains, right? Language doesn't pertain as much in the other dimensions, I think. The way you craft your volumes, and I'll talk about your past books here, some of it feels like it's it's created in a way to be very careful in how it's presented. Um, so the way you've put like sentences in a pattern or mm-hmm. some are redacted or some are like m- big gaps or, you know, mm-hmm. weird characters all over the page or... You know, there's been a lot of kind of what I would call experimental to a layman, like somebody just sure. coming in, looking at your poetry going. And, and, and the first thing they would say is like, this isn't roses or red, violets or blue. This mm-hmm. is uh, what is it asking of me? And your poetry, I think, has been for me on one end, you've got like the Hafiz and the kind of it's very mm-hmm. lyrical and it's easy to access like so- songs mm-hmm. um, very easy to access and then you get into your worlds and it's uh to me it's kind of i guess like walking through the park behind the house here mm-hmm. 
and seeing all the leaves on the ground and it's colorful and it's beautiful and there's a world there, you can do that by reading it. But if you start turning over those leaves and looking under them, there's all these little nuggets. So for me, it's reading your work is very much a exploration and it's something that demands me to read it over and over again Mm -hmm. to find the little nuggets uh, within it. And those nuggets, I'll give you an example. So in the poem Yarrow, maybe, maybe you could read that poem and then we'll talk about it. Yarrow. The delicate open work of Yarrow knitting white doilies among fescue and ladybirds. Would you believe me if I told you Achilles staunched battle wounds with a poultice of Yarrow? I say the best orientation is disorientation. You say nosebleed, old man's pepper, wound wart. Who wants to half see, you complain, the underlying surface of things? Who wants to be without pain? In the Hebrides, the yarrow leaf held to the eyes gave second sight. From our bent coin of vantage, we see through the lacy gaps of flower head, air glow, earth light. What's cool about this particular poem to me is as I was reading it, I was, you know, thinking about all these things and there's some tricky words. What is a yarrow? So then I looked up yarrow and in Latin, it's Achillea millifolium. Right. And then later down the way, we talk about patterns, you get into, you know, talking about Achilles. Yes. And... That was my first clue, actually, when I read Achilles. I was like, why is he using yarrow? And what is that? Is it a medicinal plant? Because he's talking about putting it on his wounds. And it's so that's the kind of nuggets I'm talking about, where it's like it requires almost this other pattern exploration Mm -hmm. to really fully unpack what is going on in that poem. But I will say when I discover those things, that's for me. Like I'll never forget that and have that association because I've got a dopamine hit big enough (laughs) to remember. Sure. Right? Yes. What is your fascination in your process like to go through? Is it all based on those patterns or? I mean, when you're talking about it, it makes me think of this. In my early 20s, I read a book by Seamus Heaney called Seeing Things. And I think I read that book over and over again for a year before I understood a single poem, like on the on the surface of the poem. That's what I mean, like, that initial walk through like, the forest. Like I know? didn't, I was just reading it and to me it was like this thing that was like, had whirly gigs and like was flashing and like it was doing something to my brain and my body. It was acting on me and on in some kind of relationship. Like it took almost a year for it to become legible to me and it's not even that difficult a book I've read it many many times I've even taught it but there was something happening in the book that spoke to me on a level that was beyond my mind that I was that had to experience it that way for a while flipping to this to ghost talk and to the the flowers and whatnot that are in the book the wildflowers I was had moved to the Okanagan in 2014 and it's, it's so different I mean like I came from a soyas yesterday where it was uh, minus one and completely like sickeningly bright, just light everywhere. They hadn't had rain and I don't know how long it was like dusty. And I came down here and it's just rain, rain, rain. All the time. Which is so amazing. But that's what I knew. And I had moved up to the Okanagan and I was living in this very, very different landscape. I had just had this practice of writing I, I, I thought, okay, I want to know the names of some of the things around me. Names are a tricky business. Like when, when I think of names, I don't think of them as like the plant that we call yarrow. I don't think of the yarrow being the plant's name for itself. I think of it as like the name that we have within a certain conversation. 
Right. That's what the word we use to describe that plant. A lot of the plants you're talking about in your poems as well are very prolific. Yeah, they're they're wildflower ones. They're, they're everywhere. Like, yeah, 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 and like that's. So I was just jotting down like, well, I went on a walk today. I saw some miro. I saw some hound's tongue. I saw whatever, right? And noticing them in for several years, and they became kind of like talismans or, or you know, as I was saying earlier, points of attention that you know anything can be your meditation point. Anything can be the thought that gets you through the traveling to the other dimensions, as long as you can attend to it. And, and give it its full space. And so for me, those, those flowers became that. And uh, I was trained as a uh, in, in poetry, like in a fairly traditional English literature style. So I've written all the sonnets. I've written in metered verse and in rhyme verse. Um, I've written ballads and villanelles and dramatic monologues and all of those. And as I go, they fall away a little bit, like, there was a time when I thought, oh, it's important to perform the sonnet. Yes. Like, you can almost imagine, like, I'm, you're a musician and you were like, yes, I can play this Rachmaninoff piece. Or I can do the thing. Um, With sonnets especially, it's like, hey, guys, this is a sonnet. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, later you, you find Which it, matters. I, I would say that Ghost Talk, uh, most of the poems, I think of it as like a an in-breath and an out-breath and another in-breath in this book. So there are these two sections on either side that are um, very similar. They're made in tercets. So three-line stanzas. There's uh, usually one to three beats a line. So they're very short. There's a lot of white space um, in in those poems. And so they're usually in 30 to 33-line poems. And they're not sonnets, but in my estimation, they're probably... Actually, if you like rearrange them and put them into lines and whatnot, you, they'd probably be sonnets. Like, they have the same rhetorical shape, right? Like, it's like let's go into an idea, turn that idea around, uh, look at it from the other side, and you know, in a sonnet, in the history of Western literature, using the sonnet, not unlike using in Eastern tradition something like the haiku. A question is like, how many different ways to approach language in the world can you get out of this limited? shape right and like there's like you, you feel like you're playing a game of rearranging things within the shape but once you have allowed your awareness to get big that the game is just like mm, a ploy like the form is not really important it's the it's what you can get into it so for me in ghost talk those poems are i originally wanted to write one long poem that would all be like this thing and then i realized that I was I was writing were like iterations of the same poem and I wanted to say how many ways could I like approach the world within this limited shape which is uh it's made it very accessible actually right to read the book and I'm and I mean that accessible in content accessible in um the structure and the formatting of the poems yeah and and I mean that in a complimentary way because it's like nothing I've read in your previous work like it's it's not a it's and it's not historical and this is something the themes I, were so um, it's universal. Funny, it's funny that you picked out Achilles like one of the few times where I did reach back into like I know the all the things. Yeah, <laughs> like I I've I've got a list of things that I've picked out. Yeah, but like I I did make a purposeful effort in this book to not to try and write it so that it, you wouldn't need specialized knowledge to access it on a on on one level yes and i thought that like the short lines and the white space were partly there to make more contemplative space like i just want to say these little things um that were i think you're right universal or i thought of them as true i'm like what what's the most true yes. thing i can say well in wildflowers especially i mean we'll use that as one it's one thing uh, of many in there but it's the thing I love about that, I feel, you know, gardening is Canada's favorite pastime. <laughs> People spend most of their time gardening. My wife is an avid gardener. I do not like gardening. No. I find it futile. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's uh, an exercise of the ego to garden. And, and that's fine. Like it's creative. It's like, um, and it's beautiful. But I'm such a stubborn purist where I'm like, 
the nature wants to be something and you're telling it to be something else mm. and you're planting things that don't belong here mm-hmm. and uh, that's why i appreciate wildflower themes because i'm like these are the beauties that are here these are the medicines that are here these are the things that want to be here Mm -hmm. and um when the earth is speaking this is what it will present and i always take it like i appreciate gardens just like anybody else i know you're being extreme i'm being extreme rhetorical point exactly (laughs) um but i feel a comfort even when i see a plant thriving like Mm -hmm. i'm like if every plant had the roots of a, a scotch broom plant yeah everything wouldn't survive like those things are so insane. Yes. What are we doing fighting it almost, right? Can we let the earth be what it's going to be? And so as I'm reading Ghost Talk, and maybe we should have a listen to that poem as well because it is the title poem. It also influenced the cover art, I yes. imagine, yeah. uh, which is wild. Um, let's, just, let's just listen to that and then uh, get into those themes. Ghost Hawk. The principal stars visible at this hour have many names. For example, Algol, aka Demon Star, from the Arabic for Demon Star. This planisphere was a childhood gift from a man who desired whom he desired in plague years who promised he'd haunt us as a hawk when he died, and died. Now, Ghost Hawk is the only spirit guide I ever recognize. Today, the names of flowers title all my feelings. Blue Flax, Morning Glory, Goat Spirit. For example, Aster, from the Greek for star. For example, Desire, which is visible clearly at this latitude, at this hour. In your words, Matt Rader, what is Ghost Talk about? Uh, well, Ghost Talk is literally about this experience of a hawk that is the spirit of a family friend who looked after us. In visual inspection, I wrote a little bit about uh, this man, Rodney Mitchell, he was our, he looked after me and my brothers when my mom had to go back to work when I was a kid. And he, in the time that he lived with us in the 80s in Comox, he came out as gay and he was also tested positive for HIV. He died uh, in the mid-90s from AIDS. And so this was a very formative experience in my life uh, and my brother's lives, like more than I could explain in any, it probably deserves a whole set of other books. Um, He said that he would come back and visit us as a hawk. And so my family for years, ever since, like we see these hawks and it's just, it's the the bear, you know, this one we know. Like a family totem. Yeah, we would always be like, oh yeah, Rodney was on the fence this morning and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Hmm. And, and he gave me a, the, po- the poem starts off with uh, talking about the stars because he had given me a planisphere, like a little device that tells you what stars you can see in the sky at a certain latitudes and at certain times of the year. He had a telescope and we would sit in the backyard and like look at the moon and the stars and whatnot. And uh, that was part of the life with Rodney. And I still have this planisphere, and I was kind of like looking at it and and thinking about that experience. And that re- relates back to the aster and the end of that poem. Yeah. Uh, where I, th- I thought a lot about him in this past year with COVID, that like the AIDS epidemic is still, COVID aside, it's actually still the most deadly modern epidemic, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. And... In the 80s, we didn't really even, like when he tested positive, it was not clear to us how you got HIV. We knew some of the ways. We, you know, I was talking with my friend, the writer George, Il- George Ilsley, recently, and he was reminding me, because he's 
a bit older than me that, you know, when he was a young man in the early 80s, they didn't even know that it was sexually transmitted. They didn't know how you got it at all. And by the time Rodney was living with us, like my parents didn't, or my mom especially, she, they didn't know what risk we were in. And yet these men and women too, who were living with HIV in those years, like they went on loving and living their lives and like profoundly impacting somebody like he probably changed the course of my life amongst all of that, you know? So I think about, I've thought about him in, in our COVID times and like, you know, what examples do we have to live up to? Uh, yeah. And it's a nice, it's a nice, um, like there's lines in there, like the demon star and yeah. There was, you know, there was things that kind of tripped me up and then just sent me on these mega mental tangents as I was reading it. A doctor pedaled her bicycle over the River Arno. Yeah, you took photos. I took photos. I'm even in, like, you gave me a credit in one of these books. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's true. You this took one. Picture, you took it is this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Look at that. And it says, you know, Zach White. That's really nice. Well, I saw that last night and I was like, oh my God, look at that. Um, Ten years later. I know, I know. What a nice guy. Uh, so, yeah, and when you performed it and you had your class uh, read, read poems from that book in that performance, and it reads to me so different hearing you mm. deliver it than my own voice, obviously, yeah. uh, reading it to myself. Poems come from charms and spells and, and all of those incantatory auditory experiences. So that's one of their lives. Robert Pinsky, though, to your point about the discrepancy between your reading experience and like may, maybe my voice speaking the poems. Yes. Uh, Pinsky says that the poet's instrument is the breath of the reader. Nice. To some on some level, it's a kind of offering a pattern for your mouth and your breath to work through. Even if it's in your mind, most of us even, most of us will even move our tongues when we're reading in our head, you know, like, because our body, like reading is on some level still this very embodied thing, even though it's, uh, it's semantic code, you know. I find actually with your work, reading the first through is mental and then I will speak it out loud right. and it is a different experience. One of the poems in the middle of ghost talk is uh, structured different. It's not in the columnar right. kind of format. It starts to go horizontal and it starts with one. It's untitled in my copy. of No, no, it is. There's no title for that whole middle section. It, piqued my curiosity and I and I liked how it was presented because it was different you also separate it with three pages of white space I think mm -hmm. there's yeah and so it's kind of sitting in the middle can can we read that first section of that poem that one yeah okay let's do that No thing, a zero in the amber of time, then one. At the edge of the mind, a soft rhyme, then one. Jewels of rain, like, will grow rich with water, like every number were prime, then one. Storm sky, etched by lightning, dissolved by light. Twelve bodies trenched with lie, then one. On the horizon, tank columns, shattered sun. The force of force is two, a rhyme, then one. Nine grapes, eight cancers, seven days, six fires, five priests, four dogs, three crimes, two, one. In the meadow of despair grows nothing, plus nothing, plus nothing, and knots of brook lime. Then one. 
From the diamond fire walk the eight legs of the Bodhi spider, numerator, sublime earthen one. We made love in the corner of the laundromat. Many deaths, many lives, many times, then one. Your acknowledgement section in this book is so much larger. <laughs> Was that on purpose? No. Okay. No, it's just... Uh, yeah, you acknowledge a lot of people, which is cool. I mean, it feels it's sincere. A, it's a, always a weird thing because... You left me out, so... <laughs> <laughs> Next time, Zach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know when you, people are like giving their acceptance speeches and you can't... And they're like naming everybody and sometimes you're like this is so sincere and other times you think i'm gonna forget somebody too that's yeah, what i always think yeah i'm gonna forget somebody and you're like do they really need to name check everybody i don't know it's a it's a weird business i have a lot of questions here sure and i just kind of want to do a yes no yeah is your poetry about burying secrets to be discovered no uh it's about maybe leaving crumbs so that you could discover something uh, and maybe it's like an honor thing uh, is, is the metaphor I would use. When you write your poems, are you thinking about yourself or the reader? Uh, I'm an amalgam. I, I am my first reader. Yeah, that's honest. I would have called bullshit on anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Do all the plants mean things? Yes. Every poem in this book is away from city or civilization, except for a few. One poem in the middle, it mentions the laundromat. And then the very last poem, like almost the, the epilogue, on the very last page, mentions a supermarket parking lot. Yes. Was that intentional? And is that a spoiler? <laughs> uh, laundromat has my name in it, and that's why it's there. The end is, is a COVID observation watching people cue uh, those wildflowers are all within civilization none of them are actually that far away that's fair it's purely how i read it mm -hmm. you know i was like seeing myself in some distant meadow yeah as i was reading it um i, I realized writing this book that there are very few places that are are far enough away from civilization to not be within yep. civilization I like that too. I like the banality of laundromat and supermarket mm -hmm. parking lot. And lately during COVID, I've been finding, I went through this real phase of where I would get to the parking lot and I would just sit in the parking lot instead mm -hmm. of going grocery shopping. And I'd just sit there for like 30 minutes and I couldn't get <laughs> out of the car. Yeah. And I didn't know why. And I almost had to trick myself to open the door and go. Because once I was going, it was fine. Yeah. So I have this weird even through the last couple of years, I have this weird relationship with parking lots. I feel like I've been sitting in them more than ever. It's just kind of like whatever. And then sitting there and forgiving myself and like, <laughs> it's okay to sit here. And I mean, I have a, a bit of this just generally, like even on my way here, I was stopped in North Vancouver and I was trying to get food, but I just couldn't, didn't want to go in anywhere. Yeah. And, and, and I, I just I was like, Oh, I can't do it. I don't want to connect with people sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot happening and it can be very overwhelming. That's how I feel. Like I go into a r r space and I'm like, there's so much happening here. Yeah. Uh, anyways. Hmm. Okay. Back to dreams. You mentioned in the poem, dream berries, yes. uh, that you're captioning your dreams. Yes. Is that how you think of your poems? Sometimes. Dream berries. I'm closed captioning dreams no one else can see, a friend tells me in a dream where I show him the red thimbleberry and he knows exactly what I mean. Along the river where you and I stop to breathe, white linen handkerchiefs and pockets of broad green leaves. I know it's not enough to make things pretty. The dark steel girder bridging the river it's spray-painted swastika and names. 
When I was young, I couldn't breathe without the help of a machine twice a day. Outside the truck, we watched the heavy river play its reel of sky and trees. I'm trying to get ex- people excited about the idea that poetry is just this massive world, but it's also free to explore and limit yourself how you need to. I mean, I think the thing that's really great about a creative writing class, especially a poetry class in a university level, is that it's one of the few places where right from the beginning, what you imagine, what you feel, and what you think is the subject that you're studying. And so the techniques of poetry arise as they're needed to investigate those aspects of yourself. And so sometimes it maybe it feels like you're learning, like in any other kind of self-exploratory kind of thing where you, you learn some techniques, breathing or imagery or, or whatever it is, you know, to, to explore those things. Poetry, technique, craft things are work in a similar way. Learning about them allows you to be part of the community of people who interact with poetry in greater degrees, right? So uh, Yeah, and depth. Yeah, so you, and, and there's more finesse to it. There's more, like, there's all kinds of things that are unlocked once. Uh, it, it's really know, hard things. for me to understand the panel of, like, something like the Griffin Prize, yes. for example. It's like, who are these? <laughs> who are these people? Who are these, like... You know, just like academics take everything so far, part of me wants the super academic panel. The other part of me wants like Gordon Ramsay or like some celebrity judge that has no idea what poetry is to hold it together almost because it can get so out there. I do think that we can get pretty lost in that. Like that's one game to play. Right. And it's a fun game to play, you know, like you played sports, you know how like there's playing sports with people who know what they're doing and how it's different from playing that same game with people who don't know what they're doing. And that both can be fun, but like you can do stuff when people have skill Gil. and, and know yeah. how the game's supposed to work. Yes. You can like that game plays at this whole other, like it's, it's just different. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that, playing basketball with your kids isn't basketball though. Right. You know, um, and, or that it's, or that the game played by all of the like experts is necessarily, you know, sort of better, like on some higher lane plane necessarily. Like it's just uh, different. It's like, I don't know if I would trade. Well, it's shoot. like talking to your kids about Pokemon. Yeah. It's like, you're just not going to understand what's going on or the level of enthusiasm <laughs> that is in play. But I mean, like, like I love basketball. Like I love, and I love watching basketball. And I think those get like it's my probably my favorite sport. Yeah. And uh, I would never trade that all that basketball for shooting hoops with my kids. Like I would take shooting hoops with my kids over that every time. So what does this tell does me about, yeah. about basketball? Like, uh, and I guess I'm saying this in re- respect to there is a wonderful world of like technical knowledge, historical knowledge, access to the uh, history of English literature or Western literature writ writ large. I've taught poetry to like, you know, grade two classes and grade three classes. And I just say to them, I, it doesn't, it's not supposed to make sense. You're just supposed to like make up goofy shit and like, like say whatever, you know, and you you can teach them crazy things that you'd never thought you could teach them. Like I would uh, taught them, the Tiger by William Blake. I was and and I said, "Well, let's write poems to magical creatures." Like that's the takeaway of this poem. <laughs> you can write to any creature you want to. People are writing to their cats and to like whatever, and that's that's what you do. Or you teach them alligator pie, and it's all about the joy of making those matching sounds. Back to patterns. Like rhymes are just matching sounds, and they and they fill you up like you feel them and there's a real delight in in encountering that uh match discovery yeah and it's like yeah. and it literally chimes you know so um I, li- I like that that's like that feeling of like any kind of rhyme that's hitting you you know you hear the so anything that hits you and feels like 
that resonates. That's poems. Mm. So nice. In in Ghost Talk, I'm glad you explained to me your feelings because about what it means to you. I was wondering, is it a call to the environment almost mm. of uh, being mindful of the environment and more of a, and I'm talking in the broader sense yes. of the volume. What do you think of that idea? Well, certainly that's what I told the candidate council I was doing. Um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I think it's about, you know, getting back to the idea of independence versus connection. I'm about like, at this point in my life, I want to leave things better than I encountered them. I want a sense of completeness in the conversation. I want a sense of like kindness in my interactions. I'm failing at this all the time, but that's the thing that I'm like after looking for. I think this about the, like I'm looking at these trees outside and I think those trees, all these maple trees that are turning colors in your backyard, you know, you got the moss on them. They're just, they're gorgeous. And they are as much here as I am. They might even be more here than I am. And I just can't imagine treating them with any less respect than you would treat your neighbor or anybody or your family, your daughters or your uh, wife or whoever. Like, they're very real. In Ghost Hawk, that's me trying to find my way to that relationship with the ecology of the Okanagan, which ends up being the ecology of everywhere and inside of me. And Truly, and you, I think you bring, you you have no choice but to bring Vancouver Island with you everywhere sure, that course. you go. Yeah. I mean, I grew up here and I know how entrenched I feel totally in the land. And I think that's a great segue maybe to leave with one that resonated with me from the West Coast, which is Gosh Hawk. Yeah. Maybe we can read that. Would you do that? You bet. Gosh Hawk. When I call ghost, you call Gosh Hawk creeping me up the creek. The creek with its corpus of rock its endless vellum of water. The rocks with their pitiless solitude. The water with nothing but the rush of itself to say. I've been lucky, crowed the goshawk, as if he'd forgotten who he's supposed to be. When I forget who I'm supposed to be, it's a relief. Even now the men on the hills are burning the autumn slag because fire Fire, fire. Get out of here, the goshawk cried, circling the white arrow of its body smaller and smaller away. It's just a real pleasure to talk to you, you know? So I appreciate that you have been doing this podcast. It's been really great to hear people like Mark and Wedledy and whatnot, like, appear on this this space and then uh, uh, I get to have access to the community of these conversations from away because I'm not here anymore uh, most of the time. Uh, so, so that's a real gift. And Thank you. We, uh, I miss you over <laughs> here, honestly. Thanks. I feel like, um, yeah, you're definitely one of my people and it's, it's it's weird to have you not in the space of yeah. my everyday life. And so I appreciate that we've been able to stay connected. I don't think we have a choice, actually. No. Um, in that, I think, uh, you know, you've gone and you've lived this life in, of all places, Kelowna, <laughs> like frosted tips and white sunglasses. Yeah. And Jeeps. I, you said that to me when I moved there, and I, st- I always think of that. <laughs> 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 it's like so um yeah i don't know why you didn't show up in white sunglasses actually but um i really appreciate you so much on so many levels and probably the deepest level is that when we talk and i see you i am keen to explore kind of distant 
lands and I and I feel like this with a lot of my close friends that we're able to take a topic and kind yeah. of go anywhere with it. And there's not a lot of judgment. It's just like, how do we knock this ball around totally. as far as possible? Yeah. And I just, I love that. Yeah. I think about it. And I think that there's something to that. Yeah. That is poetry to me. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I also like that you and I are different. Like we have different demeanors and like your kind of relentless optimism is like, I actually think I, I feel way more optimistic and like, I'm more able to inhabit that space than I was probably when we first met. But it's something that I really admire. And I just think, why would I want anything else? You know, this preference for life, like the, the preference for things being great, uh, the fire being hot, uh, you know, all yeah. of those things. Keep finding the discoveries. That's yeah. finding the magic. Yeah. And so it's nice to, encounter like I, I like that you have those that quality about you and it, let, it lets me access that about myself uh, a little more easily when we're in conversation that's nice yeah. and I hope you feel good yeah I hope you feel good yes yeah. maybe <laughs> exactly. just a great way to leave it yeah exactly same here I hope you feel good Zach Ghost Talk, a new book of poetry from my good friend, poet Matt Rader, comes out in Canada October 31st, 2021, and internationally in early 2022. In Canada, you can order directly from the publisher Nightwood Editions, or even better, from your favorite local independent bookstore. Either are great ways to support the book industry and small businesses in your town. Of course, Sometimes the big online book retailers are the only options and they'll have the book too. You can connect with my guest, Matt Rader, through his social media links in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. Please leave your comments at The Ranger Cabin on social media and find all of the past episodes on therangercabin.com to share with your friends. Buying poetry isn't a normal thing for most people, but I hope you treat yourself to at least one volume a year. It's good for the soul. It'll keep your fire hot. Until next time, I'm Zach White, and this is The Ranger Cabin. Mm-hmm.